I'm regular, normal, everyday person. I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like they do, but it doesn't seem like they realize that. There's no compassion, no sympathy. The people that are on the other side of the fence that have access to decent health care and, and decent ways of keeping themselves unaffected from this situation, well, they don't feel my pain. They don't feel our pain, regular, normal, everyday people's pain. Because of the virus situation, my financial situation kind of changed. And I've just been an ongoing struggle. Uh, just trying to make ends meet. And it seems like the powers that be don't understand that this, this is something that happened that's beyond everybody's control. You know, and it, you would think that they would try to give someone a little bit of leeway, but you know, I, it's all about the almighty dollar, it seems like. So it's like every man for themselves. The volume of evictions has really fluctuated quite a bit during the pandemic, from really high in the beginning as people started losing their jobs. Many people had a, a month cushion on their rent, but when that was gone, then we saw the evictions coming in. So I think the problem with eviction in Nebraska and really nationally has been there forever, for as long as there's been a landlord-tenant relationship and as long as it's been an adversarial process to evict them, mainly because of the imbalance in power. And what we saw with the pandemic is it really just highlighted all of these imbalances and we saw all of these problems just blown up into such a, a greater magnitude. People need to hear about like actually what's going on and how it's actually affecting people. It's, it's, just, it's just ripping people apart. Well, I was working at a dog kennel um, before the pandemic and then we had to shut down. I was waiting for unemployment. Unemployment took forever. And then the stimulus check came, and then I, that's how I was able to pay the deposit. But the guy was like, you know, this is non-refundable, like, I'm gonna give it to somebody else. So we actually moved in on a horrible note. So then everything just kind of snowballed from there. It was, he was like, well, I don't know you, and it's been, you're four days past due. I'm putting an eviction notice out. If they wouldn't have helped me, it was it was Ryan Sullivan and his team. If they wouldn't have been there to help me, my kids and I would be in our car right now. Tenants Assistance Project is a grassroots program with the primary goal of providing tenants assistance who are facing eviction, whether direct representation at the eviction court or providing them assistance in obtaining rental assistance. Some trends that we've seen anecdotally, we see a disproportionate amount of uh, people of color, people with disabilities, and single mothers represent, again anecdotally, but it seems greater than 50% of the cases we see fall into one of those categories. The Landlord-Tenant Act, which was adopted in 1972, had really been stripped from it most of the recommended tenant protections. One of those is tenants don't have a right to uh, reschedule their hearing or to continue the hearing. That really has made it difficult because a lot of times our tenants have defenses and that's really been surprising to a lot of people. The assumption is, well, they didn't pay rent, what's their defense? Well, I would say in greater than 50% of the cases where we've assisted tenants, they've had a viable defense to the eviction, but not having an opportunity to meet with an attorney or prepare a case in any way is, is devastating to many of our tenants. I came to an agreement that I would be out by September the 30th at 3 p.m. If I'm out on or before that date, there'll be no eviction on my record. Pride can be a, a hurtful thing in some ways. I don't want to come, off, come across as I'm needy because I'm not. I am a grown man and I, I accept that responsibility, but sometimes we all need help. You know, everybody wants to make it race. And it's really not so much race, it's economics. It's the haves and the have nots. I'm a have not at this time. And it's not because of a, a lack of trying, it's from a lack of 
compassion and understanding from the powers that be. Growing up in Omaha all my life, I went to predominantly black schools. 1978, they started the busing situation, so I got bused to a predominantly white school, and it was a culture shock. But we survived it. I think people, regardless of wherever they live, they want to be able to live in a safe community. They want to be able to see people that look like them and have the opportunity of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness something that every American does not have. You know, I tell people a lot of the times uh, the empty lots and empty spots that you see throughout this community have been this way for 50, 50 plus years. You've got an area of the city that, uh, that has just become more dilapidated over time and very little investment back into the area. Well, redlining is, is where an imaginary boundary has been created that prohibits a group of people from access or moving out of that area. And it's an area that's determined to be risk area for, for investment purposes. You know, we tend to focus on the impact that redlining has had on, in particularly African Americans, from moving outside the red line, but we don't address the true issue of how it impacts within the red line because it, it does prohibit home ownership and we know home ownership creates wealth. It creates generational wealth. Well, let's just say where I lived was within that red line. 1968 was when they passed the Fair Housing Act, which basically abolished redlining. I myself did not know that it was redlined or it was an area where only black people lived. I myself didn't know that I was poor until I became an adult. No one's poor because they want to be poor. No one's homeless because they want to be homeless. No one is getting ev evicted out of their home because they want, want to have their children sleep in their car tonight. When, when something doesn't impact you or affect you, you, you don't see a problem, you know? But if it impacts you and affects you and, and you're wondering where you're gonna sleep tomorrow, then it's a different thing. Culturally, as far as housing goes, I've always had a roof over my head. My grandparents and my aunts and uncles, we all, they own property, we owned our homes. So I never experienced any situation like I'm in now. It just seems like, you know, you take two steps forward and then you end up taking one back. But instead of taking one back now, it's like I done took five backwards. I just uh, hope that me saying what I'm saying right now will not only help myself, but can help other people. My husband's from the Santisu tribe. Um, it's where he was taken back out to Santee to be buried. And I, I'm Blackfoot. I've heard the misconceptions that uh, natives get a lot of money for their land and all this stuff. I'm like, where did you hear that? It's all about the land. It's not about the people on it. And that's what it should be. This is the trailer that they were trying to take from me when they took me to court. They were asking for a seizure of property. They were trying to get the title and seize this. Yeah, there is a lot of things impacting natives right now, including, you know, with the housing and all of that, the COVID. For myself as a native, what's impacting me the most right now is just my finances due to, you know, the recent events that have caused me to take time off from work, trying to get, you know, like unemployment going and other assistance stuff. It's been slow going. 
the root of problems for some of Native Americans in housing is I feel like, you know, if they didn't grow up with the mindset of, you know, you can be a homeowner or you're just going to rent. The biggest housing concerns in Nebraska, I think, is there's not enough housing. There's not enough funding to help us get housing. We provide affordable housing throughout 15 county service area of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska. We take applications from all Native Americans. Our focus is, you know, to make sure that it's safe housing, healthy housing. You know, our goal is to help tenants and applicants become self-sufficient. I do believe that the problems stem from, you know, the history of how things you know were done in the past so at one time we weren't counted a tribe anymore so um, people had to kind of move out and and do other things and find jobs and uh, off their reservation because at one time they did actually have land but there's not sometimes a lot of stuff to go back to if, especially if we went back to reservation for jobs and things like that a lot of that keeps them down or keeps them you know, from not reaching out and doing better. Throughout my childhood and everything, there was a lot of years that uh, we didn't have a home. I've spent winters in tents at campsites out at the lake. The eviction, it really opened my eyes. So I decided to start a um, nonprofit outreach program for homeless individuals, natives, Native Americans focused, but not exclusive. The name of the organization is going to be Bob's Place. Bob's my husband. He was more than willing to help those that needed it. To be able to carry something on in his name, you know, it means the world to me. It's like a piece of Bob is still living on, that he's, he's still doing what he, he would have done in life. You know, getting his word out there that you need to stand up for yourself, you need to be strong, you need to go for what you want and not take pity on yourself. When um, the eviction took place on the, the third, I had nowhere to go then. I didn't want to go to the mission. You know, I was in limbo, just basically just going back and forth around the building, spending my time in split places, and then just, I sleep outside. Sleeping outside at the bus stop, you know, just laying there, you know, still trying to figure out, you know, a few resources, calling a few places. I actually was supposed to start a job the next day. I couldn't start the job because um, the eviction was going on. I believe the system is set up for people to fail and find their own way, you know, within their failure. I came to Lincoln when I was 17 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as a state ward. Being a ward of the state, basically, it was a label. Now that label sticks with you. You may want to go apply for a job, and they probably seen you on the news for a case you've been found innocent of, but they don't know that. Only thing they know is, oh, I seen him on the news. You know what I'm saying? And it, it actually, it, it has a big effect on your life. I was labeled with onset schizophrenia. I, I never did anything to be in the system. I was just a product of my environment. So being low income or considered, you know, mentally disabled or handicapped, I felt like I never fit these modes. I withheld rent due to maintenance concerns. I felt through a hardship in which I could have caught up on rent if I wanted to, but why catch up on rent when your maintenance concerns, the things that's deemed as essential are not being given, as far as my plumbing, my water, sewage coming out of the pipes. What we've seen a lot down at the courthouse are retaliatory evictions. And by that, I mean evictions where the tenant filed a complaint with the city or even just asked for basic repairs to be made. And the landlord, in response, uh, evicted them either immediately or just gave them a 30-day notice or sometimes breached the lease because the landlord would rather have somebody in there who wasn't complaining or who wasn't asking for repairs to be made. One thing that is a little bit disappointing is that oftentimes tenants only course of action for something that they've asked their landlord to fix and 
they're not fixing it is a 14 30 day notice which basically means that if you don't fix the issue within 14 days in 30 days i'm moving out and our lease is terminated that's really frustrating because a lot of the times tenants are continuing to endure conditions and situations where they don't have the affordable and adequate housing that they need. On the flip side, a lot of landlords are really lenient. They will try to work with a tenant because evictions are expensive for landlords too. That turnover is lost income on their part. Because of this, it creates this really tenuous relationship where a tenant will not want to speak up because they know that they're getting a cut from their landlord or that their landlord lets them pay their rent late and they just don't want to cause any more trouble that would jeopardize their housing situation. I don't feel as if it's just behavior to evict people who are going through a hardship. I feel as if landlords should actually try to come to some type of mediation or agreement and try to see the bigger picture. Oh, this person is going through a hard time hey, let me, let me help this person as much as I can. Let me see what his concerns are or complaints are. And let me see how I can assist him within making his life easier so he can make my life easier. lost in translation when I tell my attorney to tell their attorney to tell them. We talked and we worked things out. We wrote up a new lease, decided to do it month to month for a while just to you know make sure and she agreed to try to build a relationship and you know show them that I'm not what they think I am because of the way that things had started out. The impact and benefit having legal representation in these cases is just significant. It's critical, it's night and day difference. In so many of these cases, once the landlord has filed an action and is coming to court, there's often very little room to negotiate. However, when there's attorneys on both sides of the case, that process becomes so much more seamless. You know, by the time these folks have come to court, they've already gone through typically so many issues and so many crises in their lives. This is one more stressor on them that makes things very difficult and very unbearable for them. And so having someone there to kind of take that, that task away from them and, and to be able to communicate without all of the emotion I think is just absolutely critical. My kid's dad is terminal with cancer, so they have a lot, a lot of weight on them. I mean, they're 13, 12, and 10, and they're they're dealing with the fact that they know that their dad isn't gonna be there when they're adults. They've been through so much, but they're still like just so loving and caring, and they were finally in a place where they were all happy. They had their own rooms. I couldn't take that from them, you know, I couldn't, I could not take that away from them. And so I fought with everything that I had. Like it was very important to me for my kids to be happy. What would justice look like? Hmm. Wow, you know, I really can't say because I've never seen justice. I have no idea. I just know people need to be fair. That's all I ask, just be fair. And I want to be understood about if something is out of your control, then give a person an opportunity to make the situation right. Don't put me on a deadline and then say, well, okay, psh, and then I, now I've become an even bigger part of the problem because now I'm out on the streets, you know, and I have, I'm, I'm homeless or whatever. That makes it even worse. This isn't much, but it's my home and I don't want to lose it.
If you know anything about Omaha, you know it's one of the most segregated cities in the country. We have all these inadequacies in our housing. Whose responsibility is it to fix it? Evictions have a far-reaching impact way beyond a house. It's a community, it's a fabric of a people, it's how families and friends and relationships are built. I see the reclamation of public space being an integral part of how we think about housing and community because we recognize that we all benefit from when people have a place to be and live and exist that like helps them live a fruitful and productive life. And right now, it's a matter of selection and happenstance, luck, and privilege. And we have all of the tools available to us to address that inequity. The pandemic has really heightened this need for affordable and adequate housing. And so one of the biggest issues that we're trying to tackle is how do we make it so that people do want to invest in that social fabric of their neighborhood? How do we make it so that they're feeling invested in the neighborhood and then in turn the neighborhood benefits as a whole because you've got this wide net of people who have relationships with one another. So the first thing that comes to mind is this idea that housing is a human right and that if we're looking at our hierarchy of needs, stable housing drastically affects someone's quality of life. But a lot of folks are just not making the income necessary to keep up with all that life requires of you. And that's really unfair. So like, if you wanna talk about evictions aren't a problem, it's that we don't get paid enough, raise the minimum wage. But no one wants to talk about that. A living wage would really help a living wage, a for real living wage. It's hard for a person like me to make ends meet. I'm a single black man, and it's hard. You would think it's not, but it really is. Everything is not a person's fault. We all have setbacks. We all stumble. It's not about how you fall down, it's about how you get up. It seems to me that if you can see that a person is trying and doing the best they can, that they should be able to get some type of assistance without having to jump through a lot of hoops and uh, have a lot of questions about, you know, you know, is, is it your fault? It, it, this is not my fault. This is a global pandemic, so it's not my fault. If my livelihood is being shut down, I don't understand what it is that I'm supposed to do. There is a real gap between the services that one would normally get from other organizations that support housing, and so we seek to fill in that gap during this era of the pandemic in assisting folks with immediate needs that they have around being evicted and or they're homeless. And in this climate of social injustice, we really need to push for policy change. And those that are most affected, they don't have a voice around it. And we can only achieve that if we get into the difficult conversations of, around social justice and understanding that people are treated differently just because of the way they look and who they are. And until we work to eliminate all of that, then we can't have a successful nation. We can't have a successful community. I think in order to end homelessness, we do need to look at evictions. And when someone gets an eviction on their record, it, it can be very difficult for them to find anyone who's willing to rent to them for the next several years. That is a contributing factor to homelessness. I believe as a community, we have a need, and I think we have a want to help those individuals in need. And I think working and finding ways to prevent evictions is a way of doing that. Well, I think this is important because the, the right to housing and to be housed should be recognized as a fundamental right. I can also say as a landlord myself, I've been a landlord for over 20 years now. We need to realize that these are human beings and this isn't just a business transaction, but there's, there's bigger questions that we should ask ourselves. I may miss a month's rent, but can I work something out with this person to where they can eventually get caught up? Is there somewhere in the middle? Maybe I make a little less profit, but I keep a good tenant. And I, I would hope that more landlords see it from that perspective. When you see statistics that show that greater than 90% of landlords have attorneys and less than 5% of tenants have attorneys, it makes you really question the process. Is this fair? And when you go down there and you see it yourself, you see, no, this is, 
absolutely not fair and something needs done. I don't think it's fair because um, at the same time they put eviction on my name. That's going to make it kind of difficult and complicated. What people can do is be understanding, you know, be understanding towards people because you never know what situation they may be going through. Without stability, you have nothing. You can't depict your next move. You can't really focus. That's what home is. Home is your sanctuary. Home is your comfortability. As I say, it's where your heart is. For me, the word home, it's here. Where me and my husband called home. And if I was to lose this home, I'd be losing him all over again. Home to me is, is my children. As long as I have them, then I'm home. And with all this going on and the fear that we're going to be living in our car, you know, even my little tiny ones, she said, just like, well, as long as we have each other, then, then we're okay. Everyone's situation is different. What my problems are may not be the next person's problems, but I'm just asking to be treated fairly and to understand that things do happen in life until we can change the system and the heart of people then nothing's going to change.